Just give people a minute to log in. Welcome everyone to the uh, World Power uh, Presents webinar. Yep. Just allow one or two more minutes for people to join. Yeah. Well, I think we'll get today's webinar underway here. Um, my name is Wayne Helquist. I'm the Vice President of World Paravolley, and I'm just delighted to be able to welcome everybody to our seminar this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, just delighted that we have with us today a, a very strong list of panelists who we'll introduce to you in a few moments. But again, this webinar is an important part of our education programs at World Paravolley, and we're just delighted that so many of you have chosen to uh, to join us today. Um, I know that there'll be some more people joining us as we go, but uh, again, very important that we're able to, uh, to do some of this work. Uh, we are really fortunate to have such qualified panelists today, and I, I want to thank them for agreeing to participate today. Uh, again, I think it's really a, um, a, an important step forward for World Paravolley that we've been able to attract the kind of quality individuals that are involved in putting together these uh, webinars, but also being uh, being resource people for World Paravolley and for our webinars. Uh, one of my very uh, pleasant tasks today is to introduce our moderator for this webinar. Um, I'm so happy to introduce Dr. Kwok Ng, uh, who, who will serve as our moderator uh, throughout uh, this webinar. Uh, Dr. Kwok is the chief historian for World Paravolley and sits on our World Paravolley Research Commission. So he's very actively involved in the work of the organization. Professionally, Kwok is a senior researcher at the University of Limerick and University of Eastern Finland. He is currently the vice president of the International Federation of Adapted Physical Activity and the European Federation of Adapted Physical Activity. Prior to this, he was the Education Lead and Management Council member of the European Network of Young Specialists in Sports Psychology. And Kwok wrote his book on When Sitting is Not Resting, Sitting Volleyball, and, helped to, and has helped to build World Paravolley e-learning materials. Kwok now lives in Finland and hosts a series of podcasts that cover the history of World Paravolley. And uh, stay tuned or look out for more podcasts coming in the future. So Kwok, thank you once again for your leadership um, with these webinar series. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you to, uh, to moderate and get our session underway here today. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you for, your, uh, for opening this event and uh, thanks for your kind words. Um, uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to, to be uh, moderating this session, and I would like to welcome everybody in attendance here for, uh, in, in this webinar. So this is the second World Power Body Presents webinar in the series of mental health and performance. This really is a follow-up from the first webinar where we discussed issues around uh, the, the idea of the inside edge on mental health, where we had an amazing presentation by Dr. Debbie Alexander, we also had stories shared by Greg Stewart and Elvira Stenson uh, on their transitions in sports and life before we had a panel of discussion. So that can be watched on, uh, on, on, on demand recording as well as with this as well. So I would just like to give some um, housekeeping rules in that you're welcome to, to provide questions and to chat using the chat uh, function that we have on this Zoom uh, webinar. Uh, you can also raise your hand if you want to ask the question verbally. And if you were to do that, uh, we would then have some of the backroom staff to, to communicate with you in the chat to uh, follow up with your requests to, to, to speak. We also have a bunch of questions already from the audience when you registered, you, you had the possibility to ask questions and we'll try to go through as many of them as possible during this uh, webinar 
as well as with a series of questions that we have lined up. This session will last about 90 minutes and, um, and this will be mainly comprised of conversations, sharing experiences and informal learning about mental performance. Um, and, and, um, and so uh, the webinar is recorded and at the end, you'll be asked to complete an evaluation form, which we would invite and encourage you to complete. So without further ado, I'd like to start to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have one expert on mental performance, we have one athlete, and we have two coaches. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Christian Zepp, Jürgen Schrapp, Bill Hamter, and Greg Walker. Dr. Christian Zepp studied sports sciences at the German Sports University in Cologne. After working as the national team coach for the standing volleyball in Cambodia and working with Formula One, as well as rally race car drivers, came back to the German Sports University in Cologne to earn his doctoral degree in the field of sports psychology. Today, he is working as a lecturer at the Institute of Psychology at the German Sports University Cologne and works with national and international athletes, teams, coaches, federations, as well as companies and special forces as a sports psychology professional. We're really, really uh, um, privileged to have him um, on our webinar. Our athlete that we have on our webinar is Jürgen, Jürgen Schrapp. He has a remarkable sitting volleyball playing career that began in 1993 after he no longer played standing volleyball. Jürgen has competed in six Paralympic Games, winning a bronze medal in London 2012, and competed in approximately 50 major international championships. He embraces the notion of teamwork, communication and trust, and how building these in a positive manner is a path to both success and off the course. I'd like to introduce also two coaches we have on this panel. We have Bill Hameter, who has coached volleyball for 41 years. He has coached sitting volleyball since 2001, serving as USA men's head coach, women's head coach and program director. During his tenure, his teams have played in four Paralympic Games, earning a silver medal in London and gold medals in Rio and Tokyo. And last but not least, we have Greg Walker. Greg Walker is the head coach for the USA men's sitting, sitting national team. He serves as the public member on the Certification Council of the Association of Applied Sports Psychology, ASP, and on the NCAA committees related to coach education. Greg has a deep understanding and practice of elite mental performance, skill development, and balancing and supporting mental health of his athletes. I'd like to thank you all for coming together to discuss this important topic of mental performance um, on and around the court from knowledge to practice. So if you'd like to turn on your cameras, uh, panelists, what I'm going to do is I, I will just like to start things off with a question that we have. And this is on the screen. And I'll hold it on the screen just for a, a, a few seconds, uh, just to let you to, to get yourself warmed up. And, um, and, and then we'll, we'll make this as conversational and informal as, as possible. Um, and so the first question I'd like to direct uh, to Christian, we can maybe lead this is what stresses are you um, sorry not what stresses how how have you observed changes in how to deal with mental performance during your career Cork, first of all thank you for the invitation and uh, thank you for the, the nice introduction right now um, and it's uh, it's an honor to be here and that the uh, round of uh, experienced people speaking about my passion uh, sports psychology and mental performance um, today. So yeah, what, what has changed regarding um, mental performance during uh, my career? I think um, it's uh, that um, we are more away from um, uh, only solving problems. Um, it's more about being prepared enough for my personal career um, during one of my uh, or during two of my most important competitions. Um, in triathlon and in standing volleyball, I wasn't prepared for some of the problems that occurred. Um, and that showed me just uh, how important it is to finally be prepared, even for those unlikely things that can happen during a, during a competition. And that um, also showed me that, it, that it's um, 
not only being prepared for situation A, B, or C, but being prepared for situation A, B, and C helps you also to, to be prepared for a situation X, Y, and Z that you didn't think about because you can apply the strategies that you have developed for A, B, and C to others that you didn't, didn't come up with in the first place. And um, that basically has changed a lot because um, the um, knowing about the importance of mental performance, knowing about the importance of the mental side of the game um, has changed the approach that I've taken. And ultimately, the approach that I am taking today with the athletes and coaches in various sports. And I really hope that uh, this helps um, some of the athletes and some of the coaches um, to show better performances, not only mental performances, but especially physical performances, athletic performances. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Could I also ask the same question um, also over to Jürgen as well? Yeah, welcome everyone also from my side. I'm happy to hear that question. Actually, I had to learn this from experience. Uh, I would have loved to have coaches like you 25 years ago. I guess uh, with the experience I have, I have practically gone through a lot of situations and by that pre be prepared for a lot of situations for future matches. But I, I like the approach. I think it's, it's very, very helpful to think this through. Um, and it's especially helpful to be prepared for such situations as a team and not just as individuals. How do you actually react as team um, to certain situations which come up? So I, I definitely support that approach. For me personally, it was gaining it through experience. Excellent. Um, and how about Bill? Would you like to talk about how have you observed changes in mental performance sure. during your career? Yeah, um, to me, I, I'd look at it kind of in the same vein, but maybe a little bit different. Um, like you said, I've been coaching a long time, so quite a few changes in um, uh, the discipline of sports psychology and how, as a coach, I should be able to handle or talk to players in uh, different elements of the game or whatever. So. I think it's very important to stay up with uh, current uh, sports psychology trends and the data and new information that's coming out because I think it's an ever developing area. So simple things like me. So let's just take like serving. Um, used to, when I first started, they, I was told, all right, when somebody's serving and they're questioning the serve or whatever, just have them um, repeat in their mind the steps that they should take. So like, um, you know, toss the ball to the shoulder, swing through or whatever. And then I think it kind of evolved from there to uh, it, of, um, you know, just try to clear your mind or think positive or something like that, um, which seemed to help some, but also, um, uh, was a distraction for some as well. And, you know, so now I think it's moved more towards saying, um, you know, if, if you're on the service line and you, God, I don't want to miss this, um, rather than just talking to yourself and saying, you know, Hey, I shouldn't be thinking that it's one of those things of saying, you know, don't notice it, recognize it, focus on it, but then redirect it and redirect it to, some other place that you want to go and or, um, you know, like we've had our sports psychologists talk to some of our players of, you know, just think of a song or something else that totally takes their mind away from all of those thoughts and then lead them forward. So it seems like, you know, there's been a lot of changes that have happened. So those are some of the things that I've noticed. Thanks, Bill. Certainly some areas we'll, we'll come back to, I, I suppose, with these examples. But I'd just like to ask Greg as well, what, what have you noticed in terms of uh, changes as well? Yeah, well, the first first thanks for having, having me in this. I uh, appreciate it. And um, So I feel like, especially with my age now, I feel like I've seen a lot of uh, you know, changes in terms of like the performance stand piece of it because and how we train it because um, – you know, we went from a very coach-centered, uh, that's how, you know, things used to be more coach-centered. It used to be more command style. 
Um, and now you know, taking this shift towards, you know, being athlete centered, athlete empowerment. Um, and, you know, with that changes a lot, you know, because, um, you know, I think it, it kind of goes back into these, uh, uh, these ideas that we make up that, uh, you know, that people just have to kind of power through it. And I think actually going back to, to Jurgen, uh, you know, some of that stuff that I think maybe he's experienced over the years, it's just, you just gotta, sometimes you, you just don't know what necessarily you're in, but you have to power through it and being able to build those resilient, um, uh, mindsets uh, now, I think are really great because in performance psychology, we're able to, you know, categorize things a little bit better. We have names for different situations and how to train through it, you know, um, you know, whether it's teaching more mindfulness or visualization um, and in building and routine. Um, I think it's, it's great just because we've had a lot of time to be able to study these things now. And we're able to implement them better. And now we're actually able to have perform, uh, you know, mental performance coaches that are actually able to build stronger skill sets prior to being in those heated moments in competition. So um, I think it's uh, I think it's really a, a great upswing to be on right now. Um, and uh, and for sure, it's it's a it's a changing changing industry. Um, and uh, it's it's an exciting time just for the athletes too, especially being able to have a little bit better. Um, I think define skill sets before they get into these major competitions as well, outside of the technical, you know, outside of just the volleyball component of it. So um, for sure, good changes and uh, it's an exciting time to be in it. Excellent, excellent. I, I think we've raised quite a few good points there and I, it seems to be pointing forwards to um, what maybe we would regard as uh, preparation. And, um, and one of those things that have changed and what you've mentioned with some of these changes. So I'd just like to, Maybe go back to Christian about some of the, I want to talk a little bit more and maybe go through some examples and see what others have talked about of these management of stresses and what are these stresses. Um, so maybe I'd like to give some examples from that, please. If you could. Yeah, I could. Um, my suggestion right now is I could give some categories uh, that we were talking about when we were talking about stressors and then the player um, Jung and uh, the coaches uh, could add, uh, add some, some examples from their personal um, players or coaching career, uh, because I think that's, uh, that's um, uh, even more um, figurative at that point. So when we're talking about different stressors, uh, we're talking about social stressors, for example. Um, so for example, I give one example, and then maybe you can add uh, afterwards some um, um, uh, parents traveling with uh, with a team to to uh, international competitions just being there or like in Tokyo not being there uh, so missing the players uh, missing the parents uh, during the competition um, and I've had some um, athletes uh, at the um, Olympic Games last year they said well it's just a relief that my parents aren't there and others said well now I have to explain my father that he can't use his uh, um, air, uh, airplane ticket to join me and uh, he was really eager to come there. So different stressor at that point. Then we're talking about psychological stressors, um, uh, emotions that are coming up uh, prior to a competition or maybe during a competition. Um, we've had that example, um, Bill uh, just uh, um, gave the example from during the surf. Uh, or prior to the surf, what goes through my mind? Um, do I feel the pressure there I'm putting on myself or maybe others are putting on me? Physical, um, physical stressors are different, uh, uh, definitely there, um, maybe related to the disabilities uh, that individual players have uh, or simply back pain just or not feeling fit enough because um, players don't have the uh, impression that they trained well over the past couple of years. And then obviously there are also uh, some environmental stressors. If we're looking back to the past two years, um, there's, for example, um, the COVID restrictions, playing inside a bubble, um, not being able to leave the hotel, um, or maybe the, the overall organization of the competition uh, in and of itself. So we're having social stressors, um, psychological stressors, physical stressors, and, and environmental stressors. And if we know that, we can then directly uh, try to see, right, what is it that we can do with those stressors? And maybe the coaches uh, or Jürgen, um, they have some examples from themselves, uh, what stressors they experienced um, related to those categories. 
I can give it a go and I pick one. I mean, it's the one in the match. I mean, where Bill talked about the service and, and uh, you also said what's the stresses in the match. I think volleyball is a brutal game in that regard if you compare it with some other sports because we have points and decisions every moment of the game and, and that's different in a soccer game or so. Um, so therefore, I think there's always a mistake game. There will always be a mistake at the end of every rally. And for sure, then at the end of every set, it seems to become more important, but actually it's, it's always important. And what helped me throughout all the time, and Bill talked a bit about trends, for me, it was always visualizing positive moments. Uh, it's like when, when, you, when you struggle, when you are thinking before a rally about uh, being uh, on the outside and you have to attack and it's a tight game. Uh, remember positive moments where you actually scored in a, in a situation where you have pressure. It's not so much what, what you said, Bill, about it, remembering the technique, rather more this moment of being successful in the same situation and, and getting this in your brain and repeating it. Uh, because we are always at the borderline, I think, in the match between this fear of losing and playing to win. And then it's a constant battle, I think, as an athlete. You can be pulled in the one side or you can be pulled on the other side. And, and for me, it was always very helpful. Uh, to think about those success moments. I could probably talk some about all those different areas because uh, definitely, you know, from the social side of it, um, I think there were, in Tokyo, you know, we really had to face the whole empty stand syndrome, you know, and so you have to self motivate and can't depend on stand, you know, people in the stands. But on some sides of that, for some athletes, uh, that was a relief because whenever they have loved ones in the stands, it creates more stress on them. And so, um, uh, Christian, I think you said it, and that's what I believe is we have to have good. Um, strategies on how to approach all these different scenarios. Um, you know, and I think in my mind as a coach, the way I look at some of these things, it's um, the more that we can get somebody um, familiarized with um, the situations, the easier it becomes and the less stressful it becomes. You know, the more that we can create habits the more that we can create routines, those types of things. So those things can take over. So I don't have to mentally focus or think about it so much. Um, and I can just trust in, in um, those types of things, I think is very helpful on some of those um, different levels. You know, I, in each one of those, I would say one of those things we did in Tokyo was just say, athletes, trust your training and trust your, your support personnel. In other words, we felt like we did a great job training them so they, they could to think about what they needed to do. Just, just play. You've had the training. Um, we had a, a sport dietitian that, hey, here's what you need to make sure that you're at your highest energy level. You don't have to worry about it. They'll taken care of just think about um you know our sports psychologist um was there to if you need help here's what we need to do um you know if you have athletic training needs we have a great athletic trainer so we just try to take all the stuff off their plate that they could worry about and say just play the game Greg, would you have anything to add, add to that? I think that sounds a formidable system that you have, Bill. Yeah, Greg, you had something to say. Um, I mean, everyone kind of covered a little bit of the, you know, the psychological stressors, especially during competition. Um, from, I'd say from the preparation standpoint, um, you want to put, you know, I think as a staff, you know, or coaches, you want to put your athletes in positions that, they can recall upon those moments um, when those pressures start, uh, you know, building up in, in matches more. So, um, 
you know, uh, Bill just said, you know, use the phrase, you know, trust your training. And, uh, you know, I think that's really, really important, especially whenever, you know, you have all the extra stressors here. So, you know, I think there's a lot of every athlete has different factors, you know, um, in terms of their uh, you know, social stressors that could be impacted in competition. Um, and, uh, you know, assuming that everyone else, the, the physical stressors, you know, you're fresh, you're ready, you're not as fatigued, uh, you know, when you get in those big moments, um, you know, knowing that you can, you know, put an out of system play away, um, knowing that you can hit, uh, hit well against maybe a mismatch block, um, you're recalling on those important times or even opportunities to close out sets, um, is, is really important. So, um, but for sure, those, uh, the stressors can be, you know, learn, you know, learn how to deal with them a little bit more whenever you're, um, you're practicing, uh, you're practicing truly the way you're, you're expected to play in competition. Uh, I think that's, you know, I think, uh, especially high performing teams, that's what you're trying to create is creating that competitive environment and, and those factors so you can learn, uh, learn how to deal with the, those environmental stressors a little bit better. So. I think one of the things, interesting things, is that we've covered the, the term stress quite a lot. And you know, Christian's presented um, the, the different types of stresses in different areas in a, in a bubble, like from an individual to a broader level. But also, what we see in some of the research and some of the science is uh, stress can sometimes be a good thing. Um, and it depends on how you, how you kind of control it, how you work with things. So I wonder if you can just talk a little bit more about how the stresses impact you and your performance and how you actually control, maybe control, I don't know if there is control is the word, but um, the use of the different moods and the different emotions that get managed, maybe it's the management of the emotions and with the stress. Um, what, what experiences do you have for, that you can share with us on that? And I'm go I'm gonna like leave it open for Bill. You've got you're unmuted, so you can go first, and then we'll go from there. Oh, that's it. I'll take a swing at it. Um, you know, I, I think um, we have stresses in life and in volleyball, and so um, in some ways. I mean, all these things that Christian talk about, you know, the social stressors, psychological stressors, we see those every single day. And it's what we do with it or how we manage it in our everyday life that makes a difference. But I think in sport, it just uh, makes it super sensitive or really highlights it. And so it's really more pronounced for us. But, you know, um, I don't know about the other presenters, but, you know, when I am presenting, I get a little stressed out about it. Do I have the information that I need? You know, how am I going to do this? And it's all self-imposed stress, right? So I have to learn, all right, what are the, I need to rephrase that. What are the good things that can come out of this? What, what can I add to it and look at it in a different way as well? And so I think I try to look at those stressors like that and just go, um, what can we do to try to learn from everyday life, present them into the sport and then try to help within the sport so that it can help in everyday life as well. I mean, that may be an oversimplification, but to me, that that's kind of how I try to look at it. You know, and it's when you get frustrated, what is it that you're going to do? Because we don't just get frustrated in volleyball, we get frustrated in life as well. Thanks, bro. Yeah, I think that, that for me, always the positive element with, with, with volleyball is then it's a team sport and you're not alone. And uh, as said, I think <clears throat> stress as such is positive because actually it just makes you gaining attention and, and understanding that, that you're at a higher activity level generally. It's then just how you can direct the stress, um, as uh, as has been said before, and and that's I think is so crucial in team sport that this notion of momentum and and you have individual momentums and you have a team momentum and I think when when someone is not at the peak and and turns to the to the negative side of stress, 
there's always the chance for the team to pull him or her back. Uh, and that is, uh, I think, a huge, huge uh, benefit of team sports. Uh, but that is also why it's so important that you are truly a team. Uh, because if people then don't use the power of having positive energy, energy to pull back people who are at their low level at the moment, you're not really a team. Uh, if everyone's competing for himself, herself, it's very different than everyone competing as a team. Uh, if I remember in 2012, we won the bronze medal, but actually in the, in the quarterfinals, we were back uh, zero to two sets against China. And if we would have started as a team to just feel miserable, uh, there were most likely a lot of people who felt very miserable, but we all still had some guys who were at the positive side, who scored and then and, and pulled the others back and we kept together as a team and helped each other. And then the momentum turned the other way around and we won this game 3-2. I think that is, the, that is so important in, uh, in, in volleyball that, that we are really clear about this power of a team to pull people back and to switch the momentum again, to use the stress in a positive way and not in a negative way. I, I think um, there are some very important aspects that uh, both Bill and Jürgen just uh, raised. Uh, I'm just starting with uh, Jürgen's uh, points, um, which is uh, the, the importance of the team. So the team can put more pressure and mo more stress on the player, um, but can help to relieve stress from the player as well. Um, different sport um, in uh, 2016 um, in soccer, Real Madrid was playing uh, the third year in a row in the Champions League final. And um, Marcelo afterwards gave, a, uh, gave an interview and he said, I was so stressed, I was so scared um, uh, prior to the game. And I really didn't know how to play the game. And then Cristiano Ronaldo came from the, from the restroom and just walked through the locker room and he said, well, guys, are you as scared as I am right now? And that took a lot of pressure from Marcelo and the rest of the team because they saw even Cristiano Ronaldo is scared. Even he has pressure. Even he is, is experiencing forms of stress. And that is important that I am not alone with that. Um, I am part of a team and everyone here is stressed. And not only on my side of the net, but also on the other side of the net, others are stressed as well. It's not me having those problems exclusively. And then um, the uh, uh, aspect that, uh, that Bill said uh, regarding the stress um, is basically what I just said. And I try, I try to combine that uh, with what uh, Jürgen said, because th there is relief. There has to be um, support from others from the outside. And then one other thing that uh, Bill brought up a couple of minutes ago was the different approach today on how to uh, deal with the different forms of stress. So there's um, emotional stress, maybe, maybe I have cognitive stress, maybe I'm unable to concentrate during the game. Um, maybe I need to go to the restroom um, again and again, uh, which is just a typical stress reaction. And how do I deal with all of that? And how do I deal with all those thoughts coming up to my mind? And that is um, basically not exclusively, well, just think positive, which it has been a couple of years ago, try to focus on the positive aspects, et cetera, et cetera. It's also accepting that that is what my mind just does. Our head, our mind is just like a popcorn machine. That's the metaphor that I always use. Um, you can't stop a, uh, a popcorn machine once it's uh, hot enough and there's corn in it. And our mind just produces thoughts just as a popcorn machine produces popcorn. And we just have to accept that, that those negative thoughts might come up from time to time. And acceptance at that point is one of the most important things that we can learn as, and now I'm uh, closing the circle to Bill, as always in life. Um, life informs volleyball, volleyball informs life. And if we are able to deal with all those negative thoughts in life and accept that those thoughts are coming, it helps us also to have that habit once we're in training, on the court, during competition, etc. So it's not about thinking about sports psychology as something that's exclusively important to sports and competition and training, but rather something that is um, personality development for life, which helps in sports as well.
I'm going to jump off that one. And, uh, you know, so outside the volleyball, um, you know, I just think about back to so, so reflecting on just the life part of it. Um, stress, stresses can be great just because the stress can cause the pressure. Um, you know, and that internal dialogue, I think, is really important to be in sync with. Um, uh, you know, we refer a lot to, you know, a learner's mindset or a growth mindset. Um, and that pressure, you know, there's moments of stress and pressure can cause um, really good positive change. Um, but it doesn't always have to necessarily be the positive change. It's also, uh, I think, being really good at um, learning to develop good self-reflection um, and, and just be more mindful in those moments. Um, and uh, I think the self-reflection part of that from the stress and the pressures that are caused uh, help just because you can acknowledge uh, where you are, how things are going. Um, and uh, I know uh, some places are for them, I guess, almost as temperature checks, being able to be more in sync with how you're feeling and acknowledging it. Um, but the, the stress and pressures, I think, are, you know, are a good thing that you can really uh, have a lot of uh, internal growth from. Cork, one more thing uh, on that. Um, I liken some of this back to your specific question. It's, you know, my cardiologist tells me that heart, I need to go run and put my heart under stress. Because when I put it under stress, it gets stronger. I don't always like the idea of that, but I, so I have to put myself under stress. Um, and it can make me better. I think in volleyball, it's the same way. I think we have to practice putting ourselves under stress so that we know how to handle it and we can counteract it and it makes us better. Sometimes the game puts us under stress and then we have to learn how to do that. But I think it's a lot better if try to match that beforehand. And the only other thing I'd say to that, I know this isn't about recovery per se, but I, I am, a firm believer that with high stress, we also have to have high recovery. And I don't know that um, in life or in sport that we do that well enough that um, to be able to deal with more stress, we also have to have good recovery. Bill, I'd like to add one, uh, one um, point here, and that is, um, how do I perceive stress? And is it not, and for me, it's not talking about good stress or bad stress uh, or, or positive stress, whatever, uh, whatever the terms here. Um, what I use is, um, uh, is this stress, is that situation right now, is uh, what I'm perceiving, is that functional or is that dysfunctional? Because we have some players who really need that stress who need to be nervous before a game, um, and um, only then they're able to perform well. And on the other side, we have players who really need to be as relaxed as possible um, to perform to their highest levels. So what is functional for one might be dysfunctional for, so, for someone else. Um, and thus, I think it's, um, it's appropriate to talk about functionality and dysfunctionality instead of um, positive or negative, or is that good for me or whatever. Um, and once we change that, um, the, this wording, I think it changes the perception of what stress is. Because just as you mentioned, your cardiologist says, you have to put your heart under stress. So stress is something functional for your heart. As stress in some situations, is something functional for yourself during competition or during training or whatever it is. So we have to talk about the perception and our attitude towards stress because stress can be something that is functional, something helpful for our life and for volleyball as well. Yeah, I, I think I've seen these terms used in what we call the ISOF model. The, Individual zone of optimal functioning, which is uh, something that's come from this, you know, historically. Don't, maybe I don't need to go through it, but I'll just talk about it briefly in terms of the inverted U, in terms of anxiety leading to stress, and then having individual levels of where that anxiety stress is, and then leading to understanding different types of um, optimal functioning, and then understanding with your emotions their functions, whether they are functional or dysfunctional. And it's a, it's a really good uh, really good area to, to look into in terms of the emotions and, and the management of that from Yuri Hanning. Um, uh, and 
uh, actually that's one of the reasons why, why I, I moved to Finland is because I got a chance to to be in the same institute as Yuri Hanning. So it's uh, it, it is something that um, I'm, I'm glad that you're talking about this because I'm I'm just buzzing with with enthusiasm of, of what you're, you're you're talking about as well. And um, and and I and and this perception thing is one thing that I suppose it's it, it's how do you how do you get to that situation of asking is this through the reflection that Greg is mentioning? Is it through just the experience that the players are, you, you have from what you, uh, Jürgen said? Is it about how you compose yourself in life? How do you get that to, to find, how do you get to that realization of, of, um, of perceived, your perceptions of stress? Yeah, I, I like the way Christian put it. It's just super simple to, to, to follow that logic. Um, I mean, at the end, this also at the same time shows how difficult it is to interact as a team. Uh, because you also have to know what is functional for the one player might be dysfunctional for the other. So for some, for some players on the pitch, it's actually good uh, to put even more pressure to wake them up, to shake them up in certain situations. And for others, it, it would be the, um, the worst thing to do. So that is why there's a lot um, to be invested in team dynamics before actually stressful competitions. Um, you can sort these things out easy, much easier in training situations when everyone is uh, at their best and uh, can talk about it in a very neutral way. When these things are, and this goes back to what Christian said earlier, preparing for scenarios. Um, then you can talk about it, then you can be open and then you can say, hey, if, if I'm in this situation for me, if you react this way, it will be functional for me. If you react this way, it will be completely dysfunctional for me. But you have to figure this out in, um, before the matches be because there it's too late. I mean, you cannot start debating and uh, anyway, the pressure is so high. You, you trained for years to be at your best at this one competition. So I think that's that's really also the trick in team dynamics um, to to really understand these differences for coaches, but also for the players amongst each other. As Craig said earlier about empowerment, there's much more now. Hey, the team should sort it out on the pitch. But if we want to be in a position to do that, we need to understand um, each other's preferences very well here, and um, and actually it can lead to situations where, where in good intent you want to help, but you actually create the opposite uh, with a reaction towards another player. So um, yeah, it's, it's quite complex, but that makes it also very exciting. I think going on to the, if I, Bring a more practical kind of question in relation to that, because I, I think it's it's still you know it is so complex with a team sport with individuals, as you say that um, that someone can be making a person's fun, um, performance dysfunctional. So I, I don't know in, if you would like to share some experiences of how you felt you've done a good session training wise to get a better understanding of that, to understand these individual differences, so you can work together so you know how how you're you know the athlete the player you're playing with next to or when you're speaking to that player how to tap into to 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 make them activated in a way that's um, optimizing their function and, and their performance should i say uh, um maybe you have some drills that you could share i'm sure the audience would like to hear is some top secrets that you might have of how you do this or how you how you've experienced it I'm, I'm going to ask Bill because obviously uh, you're smiling a lot. That means I don't have the answer. Um, <laughs> um, I think like anything, you get these results, kind of like Jurgen was saying, not only do they need, the players need to communicate, but coaches need to communicate with the players and it's a discussion process on how they deal with different situations and um, how you need to highlight or how you need to help them in certain situations and things like that. But I also think that the individual players need to understand each other. So 
whether it be their behavioral profile, you know, how they approach life um, or their personality profile. You know, you have some players that are really wound tight and when something doesn't go their way or the team's way, they're going to react one way where a player that um, is not wound as tight can just blow it off pretty easy. And one may not understand the other. Well, how can you let that go so easy? You know, and then the other is, well, why are you reacting so strongly about this? It's no big deal. And so we've got to get them on the same page on then how they can handle those different stressors. So I don't know that there's a, hey, here's the drill to do it. I think the game itself puts them under stress when we're in our practices and our practice plans. I think you need to be aware of those situations and stop and talk about it. Um, all these preparations and things, they're learned in some way, learned individually, learned as a team. And so we as coaches need to take the opportunities to teach or to give the opportunity uh, for them to talk and to learn together. I don't know if that exactly answers the question, but that's that's my shot at it. I, I, I would say there's no specific drill. I think you need to in, in, in sessions outside the gym, you can create this this expectation towards you have to communicate, you have to talk with each other. And then I think you can, as Bill said, you can call it out in individual sessions where there is a specific behavior where someone is not at its best, at his best, her best, to then really also ask the question, how could we now help you? What what would be the, the response from us? individual players or coaches towards you to help you change this from dysfunctional to functional, as Christian put it. Um, and then you can learn it, but it's not as simple as that because it's also not that everyone would accept the same reaction from every player on the pitch. There's a hierarchy in the team, there's competition in the team. So it's also not just that someone says, well, now I would love to have this reaction and this reaction can come from any, anyone it's not as simple as that and uh, at the end for me and you should you can also not create this artificially in a trip from my perspective maybe christian has some ideas but um for me it's in the situation it's in the situation of playing volleyball and, and or in the situation outside uh, the court where you you see that things are dysfunctional or you see that something is, is very functional to also ask the question like what did help you to now be at your best and, and how can can we support that or do you need any support at all? Um, it is really this, this climate of openness and exchange uh, within the team and, and sometimes just also the coaches from the outside calling the moment out and then having a reflection on that and, and stopping the, the practical drill and going into the interpersonal level. Um, I would totally agree here with uh, with Jürgen and Bill. Um, it's all about developing a culture uh, inside the team, uh, a culture of openness and that it's okay to talk about one's own weaknesses uh, maybe and talk about uh, one's uh, own um, uh, stressors that one one's perceiving and experiencing and um, that a clear uh, communication is necessary in order to help each, in the, each individual player to cope with those stressors then. Um, and it's just like um, those emotions that are there. So why are you behaving? Why are you reacting that way right now? Just as uh, Jürgen um, said, well, it's just like, um, if I tell everyone right now just to stand up and get out of the front door of wherever you are right now and just to fall in love with the first person that you see, that's just not happening. Um, uh, we can't control our emotions. We can't control how we uh, um, how we feel in certain situations, and it's just um, it's just like that. Then, and it's okay to feel like you feel in any given moment. If you're sad, then it's okay that you're sad. If you're happy, it's okay that you're happy. If you're upset, it's okay that you're upset. But then, ultimately, it's important how do you react in that situation? Do I react instantly, or do I give myself some space and think about how do I want to react right now and do it then. And that is also part of the culture. So it's a team aspect, 
but it's also an individual aspect that athletes have to learn individually, but not only on the court and not only around the court, but in life. If you're unable to do that in life with the, um, with the car cutting your line and you're getting upset then and you're getting angry, et cetera, you won't make it on the court as well. Um, so it's about accepting the emotions and practicing how to cope with stressors outside of sports. That's what I firmly believe. Yeah, there's uh, there's uh, there's no magical drill. I can tell you that. Um, uh, I think I think over the last couple of years, you know, I think uh, uh, as times have gone on, I've, I've really kind of bought into like, I think honestly, we have to just be more human. You know, vulnerability requires connection. You know, it's kind of like just going up to a stranger, uh, just like Christian saying, like, hey, trust me. It's like it's just not something that 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 people are really apt to do. Um, so. You know, it's all about in these team cultures. Um, you know, I know the word culture's been brought up, or you know, the the concept of you know not playing for yourself, playing for each other. You know that people we want people supporting people, right? And and I think that's um, you know I think when we talk about the the factors that can create good or bad performances or how one impacts another. Um, I know Bill talked about it, right? Knowing how knowing how people can learn, uh, knowing what their learning style is, you know whether it's doing more with, you know, personality or disc assessment um, and just learning how each other's personality also works with each other, I think is really important. Um, yeah, because once you figure out how your athletes or each other work with, you know, it's no different than coworkers, even family members, you know, learning how they respond to pressure and stress, um, learning how, you know, they respond maybe after big moments. Um, I know we have athletes that you know, they, you know, when big moments happen, they, you know, they're, they're, they go, they're, they're really, you know, up there with their energy. Um, and then we have other ones that big moments happen and maybe they're not as up, you know, not as high as maybe, you know, as, as their teammates, um, you know, visibly. Um, but then also it's the opposite side of it, you know, like uh, you go back and you miss a serve, you know, even just the different body language that happens on the court or not making eye contact after certain plays, um, you know, learning how to be able to, to find more connectivity, uh, um, some phrase we use a lot is just validating each other, um, and, and using that concept of um, validating uh, that culture, um, that culture of collaboration that we want to have is really important. Yeah, I, I don't think we can, as coaches anyway, I don't think that we can control moods. We can try to create a culture. We can try to create standards or whatever. But as coaches, we're really responding to moods of players. And then we either have to respond to ask them to change a mood or adjust a mood or in some way try to deal with that, you know, and or wherever they are emotionally. Um, and... You know, sometimes the best thing I can do for a player that comes in to a practice and they're just emotionally wiped out is not to be so hard on them, but to just try to really feed their emotional bank account to build them up. So I think it's up to me to kind of know where those players are at so that I can deal with all those different situations. But I definitely don't think I can control those moods of, of the players. I'd like to add uh, to that, uh, Bill, um, because you're not only responsible um, for for the mood, but even not for um, for the motivation of your athletes. Um, you can create a climate in which um, athletes are maybe having a good mood because they enjoy coming to your training, um, but you're not responsible. You're not able to control it. What we are as coaches or as those who are working with other people, um, what we are responsible for is for the motivational climate that we create so that people can motivate themselves, so that people can um, calm themselves down if possible. I think in some situations we have to detach from that um, thought that we are responsible for everything in the life of the athlete on the other side. Um, we can create a climate, 
But whatever the athlete on the other side does is his or her um, duty at that point. Um, so it's not only the mood, it's also the motivation, what I, what I believe and what I've seen at least in the past. And also the theory or the, the, the research shows that the motivational climate is far more important. A positive motivational climate is far more important than uh, anything else inside a sport. Yeah, I, I think from from this perspective, I, I think as you mentioned, not only can you create a, an environment for the athletes to 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 train what their emotions are going to be or what they how they handle their stresses, um, I think there's other things that coaches can also do as well. So um, we have a question about how you how you might be able to practice mental performance and training. Now, early on when we talked about what has changed, we heard some things about. Uh, some of the techniques that I used, um, and that has to be time, whether it's basic performance things of like self-talk or, um, or how to control that, how to get routines, um, some aspects of potentially like mindfulness as well. But uh, yeah, could we go into some more practical side? So we've got into like some nice examples of how you might try to look at the team working in, in, in dealing with stress. What about some other other school things of, of the mental performance in training? Could you share some insights for that as well, please? Well, I can give it a go. I, I think there's, diff, there's two different aspects. You need, you need to have a mental performance for every drill in the training. You need to be at some level. But then there's also the challenge of simulating the stress level of a competition, of an important competition. And um, again, coming back to the point of Christian preparing for scenarios, um, you need to find ways to create stress levels of this nature also in practice session, because you cannot train the whole year in a nice and, and friendly mood. And then once a year you go to the world championships or the European championships and there off you go and, and people are for the first time really exposed to that stress, which, as we have discussed earlier, has a different impact on different players. But if they have not had this, this uh, exposure before, for sure, it's very difficult for them to handle the situation. So I'm always a big fan of creating this, this situations like making practice games very important, putting out some stress factors like penalties or whatever, um, because yeah, you, you have to practice these situations and um, you need to create those moments also in, in uh, practice sessions before you actually go to the important competition. One question that uh, one could ask uh, him or herself is what are the stressors during our competitions? Uh, is it very loud? Uh, is it very quiet? Um, all right, so it's it's very loud. So maybe I uh, put some uh, very loud music into the uh, training hall and and practice then. So I try to put some stress, uh, some heavy metal music, uh, put some uh, um, musical um, auditory stress uh, on the athletes. So that could be one one way to do it. For example, if you see that it's uh, the physical. Uh, side of the game so it's physical stress that athletes are experiencing um, you may want to um, create a very intensive training first and do the practice and the, and the training game a game at the at the very end um, if you see it's the psychological stressors that are important to athletes you try to look at that in that direction or if it's the social stressors you try to look into that direction so that shows i think i think that shows how important the theory is that you know what categories are there and then um, uh, consciously decide in which direction do I want to go with the training drill that I am uh, using right now. And it really doesn't have to be complicated. Sometimes it's only the simple things. Um, sometimes it's the uh, training match um, and uh, you're playing um, one, one team uh, invites the other team for dinner, um, if that's uh, appropriate here. However, um, adding to Jürgen, it's really difficult to create the stress level um, you're perceiving during a competition inside a training match. Um, it's, it's almost impossible. 
However, you can try to uh, create such uh, such stress stressors. But what you can do is, you know, you have that uh, player who is problem serving um, and uh, you're putting exactly that stress on that player. Uh, so um, how many of the next 10 serves are you putting into the court? And then the player decides, well, I'm making eight out of 10. And what, what happens if you're uh, making it less than eight? And then he or she decides uh, what the consequences are, or the team decides, which puts a different um, uh, a different flavor uh, to that uh, uh, to that training drill than maybe. So there are various aspects, but again, coming back to the categories, what is the stress that I want to put on the player or on the team, and then go for exactly that, not more and not less, keeping it simple. I think that's that's the most important thing. It really doesn't have to be magic. But I also think that coaches really need to be aware of it. So in other words, I think too many times we as coaches, and I put myself in this situation, when we're in practice, we get so wrapped up in the skill or the system of the game and all those types of things that we miss the teachable moments of the emotional and mental preparation things, or uh, we miss the different categories like Christian's talking about. So I, that's why I think it's important that as coaches, we're open to that. And or if you are fortunate enough to have a sports psychologist to make sure they're in your gym and that they're watching for those aspects so that they can bring those things up um, because they happen in the gym all the time. Every the court those types of things are gonna happen. You just need to catch them and use them as teachable moments. So was that Greg, were you trying to unmute yourself there? No, I, I was originally going to just share, I have a small, uh, I have a list of things I know put the question on, like what things can be, uh, you know, can someone do a little bit more in terms of improving their, you know, mental performance? Um, so there's a couple of things I thought of immediately were, you know, self-talk, because a lot of this goes into, um, into those moments, especially as Bill just mentioned with uh, teachable moments that you can have, um, you know, because it's not just, you know, an athlete or even a staff member um, doing it themselves. Sometimes it's like, it's a lot of, sometimes it can be a lot of mediated or opportunities we see, um, that we can help them through it. So, um, self-talk is a big one. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, working through imagery, visualization, um, and just working on your mental practice. Uh, and then the, the last one I really thought of was, uh, you know, specific skill sets that help with uh, anxiety or like energy management, um, which was talked a lot about earlier. And, um, in terms of how to manage it and how to how to be more, I guess, in, in sync with your with your body and how you're feeling. So. Yeah, I, I when you mentioned some of these things, what comes to my mind is um, is a measure we used to use to find out the level of preparedness athletes might have in regards to their mental skills. And this was uh, one particular measure, which was called TOPS. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It was, uh, um, so, so I, for me, I, I would, I'm, I'm now wondering whether you, you actively practice evaluating the athletes through scales, or are you using more of the other approaches which, uh, to help you reinforce your knowledge of where the athletes are at? Maybe either as an athlete, you've experienced completing some surveys, or are you, or, or, or as a coach, do you arrange time to, to say, you know, the athletes need to complete like these surveys? Yeah, I don't. Or, I, there's any you, I've done both over my career. I probably lean more towards the self recognizing. So the player needs to recognize and understand where they're at along with the coaches um, and begin to, if you've got to get into a rating type of system, just know where they kind of put that 
um, as opposed to trying to take a standardized test and some of those types of things. Um, I mean, I think both can be good, but that's probably the way I lean now over my career is, uh, you know, just trying to work with those individual athletes where they're at and those self-recognition. I think it can be helpful and beneficial from, um, for, for both sides if you combine it sometimes. Um, uh, I know in sports psychology, many people tend to distribute those questionnaires, those surveys, uh, just to find something out. But I, uh, the question that I'm asking myself is always, so what's the benefit for the athlete then? And what's the benefit for the team and the coach then? And sometimes it's, that benefit is really only very, very small. Um, I think, uh, just as Bill um, put it, um, combining maybe the personal recognition of or the, the self-reflection the athlete does for himself or even the coach, um, the perception of the, this athlete that's in front of me, combining that reflection with the survey and, th and, and then having a basis, and so to speak, objective a basis to discuss certain topics together with the athlete can be beneficial, but using that uh, those uh, questionnaires exclusively, I think, um, uh, al although there's a scientific uh, part of me saying, well, Chris, you don't say that, uh, it's surveys and questionnaires are not really helpful to the uh, to elite sports um, uh, if, if you use them exclusively. It, it can give you direct directions, but using them exclusively uh, is, is not really helpful. You need to know the, the human behind the athlete. That's a phrase that I always use. And if you don't have that human behind the athlete, the numbers, the graphics, they don't help. My, my opinion. Fully agree. And it's, it's like with many things we have talked before. Athletes also react very different to being confronted with results of such surveys. There are some people take it in and, 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 and like it and uh, embrace it and, and make it uh, part of their change and others like push it away. So yeah, I, I like that statement. You need to know the human behind the athlete. And I think one thing which is also there, in, especially in disabled sport, especially in Germany, is all of our players are not professionals. You also always have to manage the time you have with the team. Um, there's um, there's a physical element, uh, there's uh, the technique, the team technique, there's the gym, weightlifting, stuff, athletics, and then you're on the metal level. And I think as a coach, I mean, putting, looking to build and crack, I guess this is this is also always what you have to balance. And and the difficulty is especially I think with the mental mental stuff, it is very dangerous to start and and discontinue and start and discontinue. I mean, there needs to be really a clear path, and you need to. To complete it out and get somewhere uh, with that um, and to, to balance this with the other priorities which is well which system do I play who plays where and how can I develop the technical skills of every individual athlete and the team is a huge challenge um, I think it's a bit easier in, 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 in professional sports as you have more time available I think in at least in Germany with the time we have together as a team is limited we always have to balance those dimensions and, and see where we can gain most out of. Yeah, I, I think you raised a very, very important point there about, um, about the non-professional athlete, as, as we call it, even though we strive to be as professional as possible. Um, I can, if I'd like, I'd like to go back to just one of the tips that Bill mentioned earlier, which was about recovery, the importance of recovery. And there are certain kind of techniques that we can use to help with recovery as well, um, whether it's aided by like biofeedback or whether you use kind of meditation or mindfulness or something. Um, could you share some experiences about uh, about that, whether you use some some assisted tools like biofeedback and whether they the effectiveness of them for um, you know, uh, elite but non-professional athletes like uh, in, in rehab and power sports um, as well as the um, 
um, the use of other techniques as well to help with recovery. Have you, have you tried any? Um, do you have a like they call it the blue room in Chelsea? Chelsea Football Club has a blue room. I mean, they're a blue team, but they have a blue room and they have this. Every all the football players go down there and they just lie there for half an hour or something like this, one hour um, to re, you know, work themselves. Bill, I, I just I think you need to look at every player as an individual. So just as I'm not going to tell every one of my players to prepare for a match, this is what you do. I want them to have a per, you know, personal match preparation protocol. And it's something that they do over and over to get them ready to play. Um, you know, some of them like loud music. Some of them don't like any music. Some of them like soft mu music. You know, it, some just want to chit chat. What They all get themselves ready the way that they need to. They need to understand themselves that way. I think recovery is the same thing. Some people uh, can have a mental recovery by getting um, a massage. It helps them physically, but it's also going to help them mentally to recover as well. Um, you know, some people just need some time off and time away. Um, you know, some people want to actually talk about it. Hey, do you remember when such and such happened? And so that's the way that they kind of deal and recover and move on as well. So, well, I think there's a lot of approaches there that you could look at. Um, I don't know that we need to be, we, we just need to expose all the tools to the players and not be dictating to them, in my opinion. Uh, I would say this right off of what Bill said about the, the personal preparation prior to high performance. Um, something that I was able to take from our indoor team, um, our USA men's coach, John Sparrow was doing, uh, he did a little bit of stuff with a, an app called, uh, called Headspace and, you know, a, a company out of Southern California. And so it was really big on like meditation and mindfulness. And, um, and so you know, we were able, with a lot of feedback from the athletes, um, you know, they really appreciated us being able to help give them tools to be able to kind of enter into that that space um, uh, a little bit more deliberately. And, uh, you know, where we could, you know, in practice be, be talking to them specifically about being in those moments and, and what, what that meant to them. Um, however, uh, you know, like everyone has their social battery, some have longer batteries than others. And um, for us, uh, we realized that some of our athletes, you know, it was, it was the opposite effect in terms of, you know, if we continued to, to go down, a, a, uh, down the road with like using an app all the time. So, so, you know, we had some that continued to use it privately on their own. We had some that you know, did other things, um, you know, Bill hit on that, you know, each athlete's different and each of them have different needs and different, um, comfortabilities in terms of preparation. Um, and so, uh, I think for us, the biggest part was, is just really introducing tools that they could use. Um, and, and helping them be able to find something that works for them so you have them prepared and, and, and focus for, for those big moments. Yeah, I, I think, again, recovery is going to come one way or another. It's either going to be a planned recovery or a strategized recovery, or it's going to be a, an unplanned recovery. And that's usually when you have the, um, you know, mentally, somebody has a mental downfall or frustrations or physical or whatever it may be. I think we just need to be aware that they've got to have that recovery some way it's going to happen. So we're off to plan for it, strategize, give them the tools so that we can um, continue to have healthy players. And to me, that's the most important thing that we can do, you know, across the board.
Yeah, thanks. So I think this individualized approach is, is a very interesting one. Um, have you had any experience uh, either as a player or trying to use it or as a coach or even with the uh, sports psychology in, in using things like biofeedback? Is that something that they still do these days? I, I don't I don't really know. Um, maybe Christian, you, you might. Yeah, so, so for biofeedback, it's... Um, I'm not using that a lot, but I have some colleagues who are using that for slow paced breathing. Um, for example, uh, they're using apps um, uh, for that. Um, uh, but uh, actually my approach is to detach from the technology at that point, um, because technology is not always um, accessible sometimes, um, but my breath, for example, is always accessible. Um, and I can fo easily focus on my breath and um, uh, and making meditation and mindfulness practice accessible to athletes in a way that it's non-esoteric. Uh, I think is uh, is is a is a good way to help them with their personal recovery in in different uh, contexts of their lives. So. Some people I know, some people are still using biofeedback uh, because it's it's really helpful um, for my personal practice. I can say I'm I'm not using that um, uh, frequently. Sounds good. Any other experiences behind that? Jürgen, you want to? No, I, I, I would again echo what Bill said. I think it's offering the tools. I think as co as coaches, you can you can be closer to to theory, to science, and then offer the tools to the players, and people can test and try what suits them. And um, at the same time, I think we are in team sports. I think we still have to accept that we cannot make everything individual. Yeah, there needs to also be a willingness uh, of the team to do some things together, even for the one or the other might not be 100% convinced by something. I think it's always this fine line of, uh, we cannot do everything individual, we have to make compromises as a team. And, and when do you allow for individualism and when do you huddle the team together and do the same thing? So, but that I think generally, I think it's it's great to offer two different tools and then people choose and then and, and make make the right thing for themselves because that's that's what you at the end really want. You want everyone to be at its his or her best. Excellent. Yes. Um, so I'd like to bring up another question that we've um, been asked on the floor. Um, and we we will have um, five minutes to answer this. So um, it, it's about whether you find if you've had a chance to work in mental training with athletes with and without disabilities, um, whether you find there's any distinct differences that you'd like to highlight and you'd like to share uh, with us. So we, we can go around or whoever is the quick fire on the unmute button, they can go ahead and chat first i don't have these experiences but um i i think this whole thing goes back to what was discussed earlier that it, it's stress and, and mental stability is not normally happening in the court or on the court or it also happens in private life and i think if uh physically disabled people still have problems with their disability in day-to-day -day life as much as on the court then this is a topic to be solved um, but that's also that able body people can have certain problems with themselves, which they carry. So I, I would say generally, I would answer this question with no, there's no difference at the end of the day, it's finding out, uh, what, uh, makes someone, uh, stressed out, dysfunctional as Christian called it, uh, and work on this. And, and it has to be then in sync for private matters as, and then it for sure will also be the same on the court. A hundred percent agreed. Um, obviously, uh, it's it's um, there. There is no difference. It's well, 
we're all human beings uh, with different abilities. Uh, but it's basically if I do visualization with with an able-bodied athlete or a disabled athlete, it really doesn't matter. And as Jürgen just put it, maybe um, this uh, Olympic athlete has some problems uh, at home with uh, with his family, but the Paralympic athlete has some problems due to her disability maybe um, and then we have to find ways on how to cope uh, cope with that it really from my perspective it really doesn't make uh, make a difference um, maybe there are some unique topics we have obviously uh, in um, para sports but that's the only difference apart from that sports psychology is the same for paralympic and olympic sports yeah we approach it the same so i think that's right on We're the same as well. Okay, so hopefully we've been able to answer that question. Uh, just, if, I'm gonna let you think for briefly while I ask this question. Um, you have one minute just to summarize what we've talked about. Just that if it's not too difficult for each of you just to summarize in, in one minute each. Um, so um, I've thrown this out to you, you're on, you're on, hopefully you're, High functional stress right now to be able to respond to this, and I'm going to start with, uh, with whoever is going to be quickest to to press the unmute. <laughs> uh, I feel positively stressed now and very functional. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't even need the minute. I mean, it's about the human. It's quite individual, and the aim has to be to to have everyone perform at his or her best and and work on that with uh, with everyone. And it's quite individual. I just, I'm just in line with uh, Jürgen. Um, for me personally um, and professionally, it's always about the human behind the athlete here in that case or behind the coach if we're talking about bill and greg uh, because we're we shouldn't forget the coaches um uh, we've been talking about athletes all the time and how they are stressed but it's always about the human behind the person in front of us um and if they are not feeling well and if they are stressed um they are not able to perform well no matter if you're a coach or the athlete um and so the number one priority is that you're able to cope with uh, with the stress, that you're able to be present in the present moment, um, and that you accept whatever is happening right now, um, and that you develop a positive relationship, a functional relationship with stress, because stress can be helpful and is something helpful in many, many situations. And we need stress in order to perform well. Uh, not a lot to add to that. I, I definitely believe it's individualized. We need to give coaches and players the tools uh, to deal with that. Um, I would say we need to make sure that everybody has a strategy. So they have to have a strategy to deal with it. We can't just say, um, we'll just deal with it. Or, um, uh, it'll just happen or we got to help them have a strategy. Um, and maybe one of the biggest strategies um, is just to say they've got to learn how to flush it. In other words, sometimes the best thing they can do is just let it go. How can you let it go, flush it, so then you can get back in the moment and do what you need to do. Um, so seeking for the proper balance that the individual athlete needs is I think what it's all about. 100% agree with all that. Um, you know, I think I think it's great now just because of, uh, you know, we're across the world, I think breaking a lot of mental health stigmas and um, performance psychology is a huge part of being able to, to really, um, I think as coaches and athletes be able to jump more into um, truly being addressing and looking at the human, right? I think that's, Christian said it a lot about you know, the human behind the athlete and that's the most important. So, and that's working across, you know, all the athletes and the staffs um, and creating that space uh, for them to have um, that personal growth. And I think that, especially with performance psychology now that we have, you know, there's, there's, there's so many different tactics and tools and, 
and ways to approach it. Um, and I think it's just everybody finding something that, that works for them uh, for those moments. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your last few words on this. Um, it's uh, certainly lots to take home by um, with, with regards to 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 your advice and your experience and sharing some of some of these issues. I think we've got a good common themes coming up from this in terms of the individualizations, the recognizing stress and having strategies as well. Um, I'd like to um, thank you so much for talking with us. Um, so on behalf of World Power Volley Presents webinar series, I'd like to thank you all sincerely for your time and uh, sharing insights into this important topic of mental performance on and around the court. And particularly in the way that you shared your knowledge about how it, you, it could be used in practice. I'd like to hand over to Laurie now, um, who would like to say a few words about the next webinar in the series. Great, thank you everybody. And thank you um, to the panel. I, I am really enjoying these webinars, not only as somebody involved in World Power Volley, um, but also just as a person who's interested in the expert opinions, um, especially from the panelists we've had today. Um, it's my pleasure to moderate the next uh, uh, webinar um, regarding safeguarding in sport. And we are very fortunate to have uh, with us on that panel, um, a survivor from the volleyball community. Her name is Sarah Powers from the United States, who is now a coach and club director. And as I mentioned, is a survivor of um, sexual abuse as a, as a minor. Um, we will also be joined by the chair of Safe Sport International, Ann Tivas, uh, who is a 25 year plus uh, professional in the area of child and protective services. And she's based out of the UK. Uh, and we'll also be joined by Phil Dorgachern, also a very expert, um, uh, has a very expert career in child protective services, safeguarding, particularly with youth sport organizations. He is the acting CEO of the YMCA in Australia. And rounding out our panel to give us the facts and the figures and the, the scientific research, um, especially in the area of parasport uh, athletes, is Dr. Yetza Tuakwe Wursonu from Yale University uh, and the Sports Equity Lab. And she'll be sharing with us some of the findings she did on uh, a few past research projects, one that was presented at the Rio Paralympics, but also some new research projects that she's been working on, particularly regarding assistive technology and um, and how para-athletes in particular uh, can be vulnerable to, uh, to safeguarding and require um, very unique uh, trauma-informed training um, for assistance. So I hope you'll join us for the next panel. I wanna send it back to Kwok. And again, thank you so much for everyone uh, who's, who's actually been on the last few panels. Um, a, pre a preview, thank you to our panelists for safeguarding. And I'm looking forward to that conversation, which will happen in late September. Thank you, Laurie. Thanks for uh, mentioning about this. Um, so just uh, just a couple more things there. I'd just like to thank everyone for your attention, your cooperation, and the discussions we had over the last 90 minutes. Um, I'd like to thank the back room, the media support, the Scientific Research Commission, Medical Director Louise, the Sport Director Laurie, and the General Manager Phil for supporting this event. Um, if you'd like to see more webinars, feel free to contact the Research Commission with your ideas. Um, and please spend a few moments to complete the short evaluation form after you leave the session. Um, that should pop up straight away after you end the uh, leave the session. So I'd like to just say a good day, a good evening, and good night, wherever you may be, and have a pleasant time until the next time. Thank you. <laughs>